Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our new user webinar. This is Jessica Frank with the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. Today, our uh, topic for our new user webinar is question design in A to J Author 6. I did a little poll on Twitter to see what people would be interested in in terms of um, topics for training webinars, and this was one of the ones that was selected. Um, so before we get started, just a reminder, you all are on mute. If you have a question, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you. Otherwise, you can put your comments and questions in the chat box, and I will try to keep an eye on those as we're going along, and I'll also have time at the end to review um, those as well. This, this webinar is being recorded, and I will post it on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash author. And you can also download the slide deck that I'm going to go through today by clicking on the handouts link in your GoToMeeting control panel. It, um, your control panel is likely on the right-hand side of your screen. You may need to expand it if it has automatically shrunk. Um, and at the bottom, there is a section called handouts. There's two, of, two handouts in there. Um, one of them is the slide deck from last month's uh, webinar. And then this month's webinar is in there as well. And you can download them as PDFs. OK, so on our agenda today, we're going to cover where question design happens. So that's going to be or where you actually program it into A to J in the question design editor. We're going to talk about scripting questions beforehand to prepare yourself to actually begin authoring in A to J author. We'll talk about add-ons that you can um, use within the guided interview to enhance the experience for your end user, including different formatting options for your text, how to use variable macros to call out values held by a variable in order to personalize it for your end user, how to use pop-ups and learn mores, either text, video, or graphics, to add enhancements to your guided interview, to add definitions, to show them a picture, to explain a term further. And then we'll talk a little bit about tips from the pros that I've gotten from our authors over the past couple of years of working on this, and suggestions they have, and things I've seen that other authors have done um, that we recommend. So any questions before we get started, feel free to raise your hands or pop the question in the chat box. Otherwise, um, we'll get started. So where does this all happen? So you need, in order to access A to J Author, you need to be logged into your account on our website, which is adajauthor.org. You can log in under the Author tab. If you click Author, it'll prompt you to log in. And then once you're logged in and you go back to that Author tab, it will show you a button that says Run A to J Author. When you do that, it takes you to the Interviews tab. When you open up an interview in which you're ready to work on, either a new one or an existing one, you um, start, the primary, primarily you're going to work on what's, on what's called the Pages tab. So the Pages tab allows you to see all the pages or questions, um, they're interchangeable names, that you have in your interview. And they are organized by step. So by default, there are two steps and four questions. But as you add steps and add questions to steps, they appear here as well. The top, you can see where you can add a new question, a new page. You can clone existing pages. You can save, delete, and add new pop-ups as well. This is the question design window. When you click on any of the named questions you have there, it will open up this question design window. This is where you're going to do the majority of your authoring. It's where you're going to set the, st the step for that question, what you're going to name it, you can add notes about the question, um, specifically why you added things, um, hints to yourself or to future developers. Um, it's a rich field in which you can add information about that specific question. And then as you keep scrolling down, which I'll show you, um, you get different features of the interview uh, question design window itself. So the first section that you see zoomed in here a little bit, step, it's the step assigned to that page. 
name is the name of the page. You can name it whatever you'd like. We suggest naming it alphanumerically, or we suggest adding a number to the front of your name of your question because A to J sorts the questions alphanumerically. So one dash address, two dash uh, name, three dash issue, that kind of thing. So that when you're looking at the list, you can see the order in which the questions flow, regardless of what the name of the question is, because they're numbered. It um, visually tells you where in the interview that question lives. Notes are only visible to the author, so they're not visible to the end user. Your pro se litigant, your end user will never see them. Other people who open the interview in A to J author will be able to see them. The text is the body of your page. When you click into the text box, and I will show you this, it adds um, additional formatting options for you. Under that is text audio. You can add um, a short MP3 to the text um, section itself, which will play for the end user in case um, they need help reading it or if you want it in another language or whatever. And then the learn more prompt is the final thing that you can see in this screenshot. It, the learn more prompt is what the end user's avatar thinks. It's the help or the, the question they're asking that your guide avatar can then um, answer for them. So scroll down here. If you see learn more prompt again over here on the left, so I've just scrolled down in terms of the screenshot. Your uh, learn more the help you provide the answer that the guide avatar gives to the end user's question can be either text, show me graphic, or show me video. If you choose show me graphic or show me video, you can also include a short text section to that as well. So it can be displayed underneath the video or underneath the graphic. Um, the learn more help then is the um, answer that the guide avatar gives to the end user. If you selected graphic or video, it would pop up a little box similar to these blue upload buttons that would let you upload either that, um, the ping, the GIF, the JPEG, or the MP4 file that you want to upload. And you can add audio just like you can add it to the text, you can add audio to the help section as well. Um, any questions about where things are in terms of um, authoring? Not seeing any. So um, a tip that I have, and I've done um, authoring in terms of teaching a course on this and some, some work on projects myself, um, I always find it helpful to start with some sort of script. Now, how detailed your script is depends on what situation you're in. If you are the programmer or the author and you're not really the subject matter expert on the material itself, on the form, I would suggest having a more detailed script from the subject matter expert. If you are both, if you're the attorney or the court personnel and the programmer, so you know how to answer the form, then you might need just a rough outline. But at the bare minimum, I would suggest having an outline of the questions that need to be asked to the end user. So before you get into the software and dive in and try and move stuff around later because you figured it's actually better to ask the spouse stuff up with the user stuff and not after the issue, um, think about that in an outline beforehand. I was never much of an outliner in law school and so mine are pretty basic in terms of like Roman numeral one, what the step name is, here are the seven things that I need to capture in this step. Second, second um, Roman numeral two, uh, step name, here are the things I wanna capture. I also like to include the variables that will be covered by those questions. So I look at the form I have, I take a highlighter if I have a physical printout of the form, highlight all the blank spaces, come up with the variable name based on um, whatever naming convention your organization uses, um, then I note on my script or my outline where those variables would be filled in. So I make sure that as I'm authoring, I'm not missing things in, um, in the form that need to be covered. You want to think about all of the heuristics, learn mores, pop-ups that somebody might need or that you might need to get for your end user. So if there are things like um, only file this on Tuesdays or make sure to have seven copies and get three notarized, 
make sure to um, take this to the third floor, this bin on the clerk's desk, that kind of stuff that if you're not the subject matter expert and you're not the one who, who goes to court regularly and interacts with this form, you may need to reach out to an attorney um, or court personnel that does interact with the form regularly. The learn mores and the definitional pop-ups, think about those ahead of time as you're scripting. Um, We'll talk later about how to script the questions, but generally you're shooting for a fifth grade reading level. So if you have words that you have to use in, in the question, think about ways in which you can define them. So you want to find a good solid definition for those uh, as well ahead of time. Because it, once you start authoring, having to go out and find those resources takes you away from your focus and um, it can be distracting. So talking about the add-ons and things that you can do to customize your interview for your end user or to make it look um, better, we have some formatting options. Um, and A to J has a standardized look, and so you can't change the font, you can't change the color of the text um, right now, but we do allow you to add some customization to your interview. So you can embolden, italicize, indent, outdent, add hyperlinks, and add pop-ups to the text itself. Um, and we'll talk about using the bold and um, italicized. You should probably use it sparingly. You don't just like um, if something is in all caps, it seems like someone is yelling at you. You don't want to have everything all emboldened. Um, or everything italicized, you want to just emphasize with these formatting tools. And pop-ups, um, hyperlinks you can make on the fly. So if I wanted to hyperlink introduction to, say, Google, I would highlight the word introduction, click the little chain link hyperlink button, which is the second from last one, up would pop a modal, a little pop-up that would ask me for the URL. I could copy and paste or type in www.google.com. And then my text would turn blue, so I know that the hyperlink is working. Um, and when you're in preview mode, you can test it as well. And if you hover over a word that has been hyperlinked, it will show you what URL it's going to as well. And those follow um, HTTPS, so they are secure as well. Um, oh, OK, so um, a suggestion from one of our authors that came through in the questions today is that um, people, it's suggested that people not use italics, that it's actually much harder for people to read italics online, so it is a readability issue. Thank you, Carolyn, for pointing that out. Some, Carolyn might notice that when I get to the pros tip section, some of hers, because um, she, Carolyn Robinson, is one of our pro authors, um, and I have talked to her about these kind of issues in the past, so I will add that one about italics being harder for people to read online. Thank you. Um, another uh, add-on is variable macros, and the other handout that's included in your handout section of this GoToMeeting webinar is the handout from last month's training, which covered variable macros and functions and how to do them. So I'm not going to go in-depth into how to do it, because I also posted that video on our YouTube channel from uh, August. But a variable macro is a way to use the information the end user has given you to personalize the next question or subsequent questions down the line. So for example here, instead of just saying, client, what is the name of the first person you want to be your agent, or not using the name at all, you can use Jessica, which is what, when asked what my name was, I put that in, and then now it can use that information later. It's pretty simple to add it in in terms of the authoring side. The screenshot at the bottom is the back end of author in the question design editor in that text section. I use the um, double percent signs, bracket around the variable name, double percent signs, and that tells A to J, call out the value held by this variable. If that variable is blank, A to J, like it's, they haven't answered it, they skipped it, you didn't do it right, um, something like that. It will just show blank. So instead it would say blank comma, what is the name of the first person you want to be your agent? That's why testing is always important and make sure that you only use variable macros on questions that you have required the end user to answer if you want them uh, to display properly. Another add-on that is um, 
pretty unique to A to J. I've seen help similar like this in other document assembly tools, but um, I think we emphasize it a little bit more in ours, um, is a learn more. So a learn more is a way to give additional information to your end user. My screenshot here might not be the best example because I only have the guide avatar, so it looks a little weird um, with the guide standing alone asking a question. Um, but usually the end user avatar is standing there next to the guide and this how do I know question on the right would be the learn more. And if the user actually had this question like how do I know who's a dependent or um, where can I look up my zip code or how many people are included in um, a household or who's the petitioner, who's the defendant, that kind of thing. If they actually have that question. They can click on the button that says learn more and the additional resources that you as the author have provided, be it text, graphic, or video, will display to the end user. Another way to give additional information at the point in which the user needs it, we call it just-in-time learning, is with pop-ups. So here is an example of um, three or two pop-ups. The two blue underlined words are pop-ups. Um, so this question has a pop-up that is translated, the entire question is translated into Spanish. So if the end user is perhaps working with someone at a help desk or a kiosk, the helper speaks English, but the user is more confident um, reading in Spanish or whatever language you'd like, you can have that language in a pop-up so that both people can see what the question is at the time in which they are um, being asked it. So that's a great uh, thing that our friends in New York use a lot as well. And you can have any word as a pop-up um, and it will um, display to the end user if they click on it. Any questions about any of the add-ons? Okay, not seeing any. So um, general flow of the questions. Um, and how to script questions in general. These are some of the tips that I've gotten from our pros over the years. So the title is visible to the end user. Whatever name you give to a question can be seen by the end user. So you wanna keep those titles short and meaningful. You don't want them to be garbled um, or confusing because they, they are displayed to the end user. When you're scripting questions, you want to keep your audience and your goal in mind. So you or your subject matter expert know the people who will be using your forms. Um, or you, you should have an idea about who your target audience is. Um, and you should keep them in mind as you're scripting it. What would be their general education level, their general um, fluidity in English, fluency in English? Um, general um, cultural knowledge that they might have. Excuse me, I hit the microphone. Um, one of the things I saw that really, um, that I really push when I teach our students this is something that Illinois Legal Aid Online did when they were redesigning their website. They came up with user personas in which they came up with people who would be a typical user of their um, website. So be it, um, Jane, who's a single mom, she's 32, she has two kids, she works um, at a, a dentist's office as a hygienist, she doesn't have time when she's at home with her kids to do it, she has to work on the computer during her lunch hour. Up to um, like Sally, who is 65, retired, on Social Security, isn't great with computers, but has a grandson that can help her. So those kind of user personas of maybe three to five people who might be using your form, and try and think about how those people would interact with it. It's also great if you have testers that can test this that fit into the, those profiles, but um, it's not always a perfect world to have a bunch of testers on hand. Um, next tip is to include instructions in the beginning on how to complete the forms. So think of it as a checklist. If to fill out this um, order of protection, they're gonna need to know their um, a potential abuser's car, the address, um, where they work, the name of their boss, like whatever information they're going to need that somebody might not have offhand, tell them ahead of time what they need so they don't get halfway through an interview having spent 35, 40 minutes at a 
computer kiosk in the courthouse to find out they actually need their spouse's W-2, which is at home in their safe or in the filing cabinet. Um, so give them instructions ahead of time on how to complete the form. When you uh, create questions, group questions. So we've all seen forms that are poorly drafted or whatever the court needs it that way. Um, but questions about the children might be on page one, page seven, and page 12. Well, that's not necessarily the best way to ask the questions in an interview. The interview, whatever tool it is that you're using, gives you the freedom to ask the questions in any order in which you want. The form doesn't necessarily dictate how the questions are structured. So when you create that script or that outline, think about grouping like questions with like uh, questions. So all the questions about the children go in one step. All the questions about a spouse go in another. All the questions about house or property go in another. And um, and then it'll be put into the proper parts of the form, but the, it's easier for the end user if they're grouped. And always give context to the set of questions and do transitions. So I distinctly remember in legal writing getting my papers marked up saying not enough transitions or improperly transitioned. So when I draft guided interviews, I always like to think about how my legal writing professor would mark it up. So it needs, um, next we're going to talk about your children's information. Or in the following three screens, I'm going to ask you about X, Y, and Z. Make sure that you um, go through each one separately. You really want to help the end user transition and explain what you're asking of them in each section. Um, question coming in, hold on one second. Um, question that I am finding in A to J6 that not the title, but the beginning of the question is displayed in the progress bar. That's true. Um, in A to J6, in the, um, the desktop viewer, in the progress bar at the top, the beginning of the question is displayed. The first maybe five or seven words are displayed to the end user. Um, in the mobile viewer, the step name or the the name of the question is displayed to the end user. Um, we're working through an issue. We have a ticket in our system to potentially change that to give more context to the end user, like step one, question one, title. Um, and so we are working through figuring out how to display where the end user is to them. But A to J6 in the desktop viewer is a little bit different, is different than A to J4 was in displaying the name of the question. It still stands that your questions should, uh, the names of your questions should still be um, coherent to your end user in case they do end up being displayed in the desktop viewer. So thank you, Carolyn. Um, other flow of question generally is that you should begin with easy, safe questions. So question two shouldn't be, uh, why are you late on your child support? You should kind of ease into that, or, or what's your social security number? People are leery about putting their personal information into a website, um, and so you want to build trust in the end user or ask these easy, simple questions up front to get them committed to answering the questions. Um, goal is always a fifth grade reading level. You should use bold, but use it sparingly. Goes for um, italics as well, as Carolyn pointed out. But it's hard for people to read um, italics online. You should balance question formats, but um, so you can have multiple different formats. You can ask questions um, with text, with radio buttons, with check boxes, with buttons. Um, there are a bunch of different ways to ask a question in A to J. You don't necessarily need to use them all in every interview. So you can, but you try to want to keep you want to keep the look of the interview consistent, so people aren't uh, visually jarred all the time. We recommend using images in your learn more section. They are a great way to explain to someone how to do something or where to do something, because a picture is worth a thousand words. So you could have um, you could explain in a paragraph where somebody should sign on a document or check a box. Or you can have a picture of that document with a big red circle about where they need to sign or where they need to check. Um, and if those of you that are hosting on LHI, the um, file size limit is much larger now. Um, and so it allows for 
um, much more images or videos to be added as well. Videos are hard because they need to be updated regularly, but images are easy to swap out um, and don't require you to have audio re-recorded as well. And you always want to make it convenient for your end user. So that, um, that goes to using variable macros to call out information they've already told you, giving them checklists up front, um, asking questions only once. So group those questions together. Um, don't ask them information that isn't relevant to them. If um, you can ask a question one time and use logic to figure out a subsequent answer. So like, um, what's your monthly income? Don't then ask them on the next question, what's your yearly income? Just use math and logic to multiply it by 12 or, or whatever the case may be. There's a lot of functions that you can use in A to J to call out or to come up with an answer based on something your end user has given you. General order of the questions. Um, the beginning should have that checklist. It should have general instructions on how to use the, in, uh, the interview. You should have, I forgot to put in here, but you should probably have some sort of disclaimer um, that says, you know, we're not your attorney. This isn't legal advice. Um, there's a lot of good ones that um, other legal aid organizations and other authors have come up with. So if you're new to the game, you can post to the listserv um, asking what people use as their qualification or disclaimer questions, or you can take a look at some of the guided interviews um, that are out there on the LHI portal and see what other people are using. Um, sensitive questions, so you wanna start off neutral and get subsequently harder. You want to embed the questions in a safe context. So for example, um, if it's a petition to modify child support and it's because they're late on their support, you don't necessarily have to start off with like, why can't you pay for your kids? Um, you could start off with, um, it's hard sometimes for people to um, pay their monthly bills. Can you tell me what happened? So you can um, phrase things in a way that is uh, positive instead of negative. And creating guided interviews is an opportunity for advocacy. I got this from one of our legal aid organizations who no longer ask for a social security number in the interview itself because they know that their users are at uh, computer terminals in libraries or um, in the court in kiosk situations and people forget to log off or to clear their browser. Um, so they no longer ask for social security numbers on the computer, but instead they tell the end user when you print your document, make sure to, to hand write in your social, social security number if the form dictates it. We have another question. Oh, question. Uh, clarification on the question page title on mobile. I'm getting the step name, not question or page title. Um, I think our new viewer, which we pushed uh, last week, should have changed it to question pay, uh, the question or the page title, Carolyn, not the step name. But I can double check that for you. I'll make sure that um, it got pushed in our code push and isn't just sitting um, in our development site waiting to be checked. So I'll double check that one on you, uh, for you, Carolyn. Okay, so she's saying she doesn't think so that it was put, she just pushed. Yeah, I'll follow up with you online about that one. So um, it may be that the step name is displaying, not the question or title name. So I'll double check that one. Sorry about that. Um, individual questions, I'm sure y'all can read um, and look through it. So um, just generally, don't leave ambiguity. Be careful to assume what people know, something that you may know um, may not be on the top of somebody's uh, mind. Like you may know the difference between gross and net monthly income, but that might not be something um, that someone with a fifth grade reading level would, uh, would know. You don't wanna rely on previous questions. That's the perk of variable macros. You can call out information they've already given you to remind them um, what they said in previous questions. Um, and so the other ones you can just review. Um, another tip I use with our law students a lot is plain language. So we as lawyers or professionals have spent a lot of money to learn all those hundred dollar words, um, but they are not great for use in guided interviews. So again, that fifth grade reading level, you want to 
boil it down, eliminate the surplus words, use active voice, use direct address, use familiar words. If you have to use a specialized term or a legal term of art, make sure to define it. And there's a great um, online, plain language online course on writeclearly.org's website. Um, in the handout, this is a hyperlink, so you should be able to click it. Um, but you can just go to writeclearly.org or Google the plain language online course. And it's actually written in um, Cali Author, which is the sister software of A to J Author. Um, they made a Cali lesson, three of them, about online courses, uh, plain language, um, done by Jeff Hogue a couple of years ago. So it's a great tip for, um, a great tool for building plain language into your interview. We also have um, Write Clearly's tool, their grade readability sco score, built into the A to J's full report. So if you're on A to J in your interview, you go to the report tab, you can click full report. It will generate a report for you that is color coded based on readability scores. And at the end, it'll give you your different scores um, based on like Flesh Kincaid and there's a couple of other readability scoring tools that we've built into A to J that will give you an idea of where you might need to um, dial it down a bit. Um, so just, a reminder, I've moved, so I have a new office number. My email is the same, jessica at cali.org, and our next webinar will be October 5th at 11 a.m. Central. It is the first Thursday of the month. Um, let me check for questions. Okay. Um, so are there any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand or put them in the question box. Um, let me go over those. Otherwise, feel free at any time to email me with questions. If you're working on a specific guided interview and you hit a wall, don't spend forever banging your head against the computer. Feel free to shoot me an email, include the, um, the zip file, uh, download it from a2jauthor.org, um, download your interview, send it to me, and then um, I'm available for one-on-one -on -one training and uh, troubleshooting if you need it. So thank you all for coming, and uh, have a good rest of the week, and I will see you all in October. Thank you.